Are you going to leave America in 2030? I'm going to try and leave America in 2027. I read that somewhere. Why, why are you going to try and leave America in 2027? So I think the United States is going through a very difficult time right now. And I think most people understand that. Uh, we are a young country. No matter how much we think that we are the best in the world, we are actually going through the early part of our adolescence as a nation. And you can see it playing out every day in the headlines. You can see it in our, in our role in geopol uh, geopolitical events. You can see that we are we're suffering in terms of trying to identify ourselves. We don't know, do we want to be a real democracy? Do we want to be kind of a partial democracy? Do we want to treat everybody as equal? Do we not want to treat everybody as equal? We're, st we're struggling in the same way that you and I did through middle school, mm -hmm. right? My children mean the world to me. And what I want to do is give them a life where they have the choice to do anything they want to do. Unfortunately, I don't believe our country for the next five to 10 years is going to be the kind of country that allows children of today to choose and be whatever they want to be. I think our country has some growing up of its own to do before we really offer people equal access to opportunities. So for me, if I was my 11 year old son, when I turned 15 or 16 years old and I start to really care about something, I would like to be in a place where I can explore that thing. I don't think that's going to be in the United States. I think that's going to be in Europe. I think that's going to be in the Middle East. I think that's going to be in Latin America, where he will have all the advantages of the world outside of the United States. What do you think about what's going on at the moment with geopolitics as it relates to like China and the US? Um, there's a bit of a power struggle going on and there has been, but a lot of people forecast that China is eventually going to overtake or maybe it already has, the US as the sort of global economic force. Um, are you preparing for that? Do you think it's going to happen? I think that there's, there's two realistic outcomes and there's one less realistic outcome. The most realistic outcome is that the United States and China continue to compete and reach parity, equality with each other. That's the most realistic outcome. Maybe the United States remains 10% bigger Maybe China gets 2% bigger economically, but they approach parity. They approach equality. I don't want to live in the United States when it loses so much status that another country reaches economic parity. Think about that for a second. The world is accustomed to one superpower. Once there are two superpowers, everything changes. There's two massive languages and you're going to have to choose which language you speak. There's two currencies. Which currency are you going to save your, your money in? There's competing priorities. There's competing politics. There's equally massive, sophisticated militaries. When you are in one of those two countries, at the moment that they reach parity, you are in the most dangerous position because the number one target for China will be the United States. The number one target for the United States will be China. Right now, there's not parity, there's not equality. So the United States has to worry about everybody. And China doesn't really have to worry about many people at all. But as the, that equality gets closer and closer, there's more and more threat. Think about it in business terms. When you're the industry leader in your business, Google, you don't have mm -hmm. to worry about much. You have to worry about all the little guys, but nobody's really a direct threat. But as soon as somebody else rises to meet you, you have to worry about it. The leader used to be Yahoo, mm -hmm. right? Yahoo had to see what it's like to lose and gain parity with Google only to then be eclipsed, right? So most probable outcome, we reach parity. Second most probable outcome is that China does supersede us by small amounts, right? 5% GDP, 10% GDP. And the United States has to regain its momentum to try to gain back the edge. So now you have this cycle back and forth right? Where for five years, China is the leading GDP. For five years, the United States is the leading GDP. And you have this waffling back and forth, which makes you even less secure than if you were in direct parity. But that's, that's a scary place to be as well. You still have to lose all the influence to get there. And when you're there, you never know how long it's going to last. Do you think we're already engaged in a form of World War III? Yeah, absolutely. I think World War III is already happening. I think World War III is not what people think it was going to be. I think people were afraid that World War III was somehow going to look like another World War II. Instead, World War III is a, a war of proxy nations. 
it's a war uh, it's a war where smaller third world countries are competing against each other and they're being funded by larger countries that are actually in conflict with one another ukraine and russia us is funding ukraine russia is obviously taking care of itself but the real conflict in ukraine isn't about ukraine it's about the west versus russia the same thing is going to happen with taiwan and china when the time comes that that china makes its biggest move on taiwan it's already made the small moves on taiwan when it makes its largest move on Taiwan, it's going to become a question of China versus the West and whoever supports Taiwan. So going back to where we started then, um, the average Joe, the average Joe's listening to this conversation now, what they really want is to make their life better in whatever subjective measure that they consider better to be. Um, they want to start that business. They want to launch that project. They want to kind of get, get outside of this sort of emotional prison that they live in where their life is dominated by perception, what they, what they think, their own sort of confines of their identity. What is the sort of closing argument and closing advice you give to that average Joe to liberate themselves so that they can pursue whatever they want to pursue? So the, the most important thing is to take action. That is the most, even if it's the wrong action, if you take the wrong step, if you take the first step in the wrong direction, the difference between you and the person who doesn't take a step at all is the world. You have to take the first step. You have to take some kind of action. Just by taking action, you show that you're not trapped by fear. You show that you're willing to challenge your own perception of the world and try to gain some perspective. It doesn't matter what that action is. I don't care whether you read a book, whether you buy a program, whether you, whether you sell your first prototype, take some kind of action because nine out of every 10 people are not going to take any action. You already have an advantage just by trying. And so few people understand that. They think there's some kind of advantage in waiting. There isn't. The longer you wait, all you're really doing is giving the other nine people a chance to be the first one to take a step. If you take the first step, you beat the competition right out of the gates. And you know this as well as I do, even if your first three or four steps are fumbles and trips and you fall on your face, by the time you stand up, you're four steps away from the rest of the competition. And you've learned a lot in those first four steps. So my suggestion is take action. Take action using the skills that we talked about today. Take action using the skills that you've talked about on some other podcast. Just take action. Identity. We talked about how the, the CIA kind of rewrite your identity a little bit so that, you know, it gives you some sort of cover. But one of the things that stops us taking action is our own identity. What have you come to learn and what do you think now about the role of identity, how it gets in our way and how we can liberate ourselves from it? The worst person to determine who you are is oftentimes you, because you see it all. You live in your own secret life. The rest of the world sees your public life, even if your public life is accidental. The world sees you differently than you see yourself. So when you look at yourself, it's like looking through a magnifying glass. You see every wart, you see every, every crevice, you see everything wrong because you have the magnifying glass. The rest of the world, not only do they not have a magnifying glass, but they're standing 10 feet away from you. So they see something very different than what you see. So a lot of times, whatever you think about yourself is actually inaccurate when you apply it against the test of perspective, because what other people see and what other people think of you, you are usually very wrong from what they think. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest, not knowing who they're going to be leaving it for. Now, the question that's been left for you in the diary of a CEO is um, very, very interesting. What is something you used to strongly believe that you have fundamentally changed your mind on? I used to believe that people could be equal. And fundamentally now, I know that people will never be equal because equality is not really the thing that we're after. What we're secretly after that we don't want to admit to is we're always after being better, having more, being in a better position than everyone else. So we will constantly strive to take advantage of secrets, to take advantage of opportunities, to find an edge that we do not share with other people. But publicly, we will say that we wish there was more equality and that we want there to be more equality when secretly we don't. 
I used to be one of those people that wanted everything to be equal. And now I am one of those people who is very happy in a world where things are not equal. Why? Because I see through the noise. I understand that what we want isn't what we actually say. So these politicians that are saying, you know, maybe on the left that are saying, you know, we want equality, we want everyone to be equal. You think they're bullshitting? Absolutely. That's not what they want. What do they want? What they want is more of the current status quo, which is to have conflict with the opposite side. And what they also want on top of that is to be in a position where the masses trust the politician to be in control over more aspects of the population's life. 